I'm Rachel. I'm 27 years old. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, James. I'm 28. My name is Raphael. I'm 33 years old. Yes, hi. My name is um, Samuel. Uh, originally from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm from Connecticut and uh, I live in New York now. I'm from uh, Newark, New Jersey. I'm a DJ and a tattoo artist out here. I'm newly divorced. And I'm a necrophiliac. And I'm, I'm a necrophiliac. Uh, and I guess I'm a necrophiliac that might have had a little something to, well, it definitely has something to do with my divorce. And uh, essentially I've, uh, you know, I've been a, ne a necro since I was a kid, you know. My name is Norman and I'm the uh, president of uh, Necrophiliacs Anonymous and uh, I, I, I will admit it to you, I am on camera, uh, on the record, admitting that I am a necrophiliac. When did you first realize that you were a necrophiliac? Hmm. Uh, when I was younger, um, in high school, I used to uh, play with dead like, animals. Uh, when did you first realize that you were a uh, necrophiliac? Well, we used to have a cemetery right behind my house and I would go sledding in it when I was a kid. I just felt safe whenever I was there and sometimes I would sneak over after school and just meditate looking at the tombstones, just wondering what was below. I think that's when it started. And um, how old were you when you first experienced your dead body, your, your, your first dead body? Um, I was uh, 20. Uh, how old were you when you first uh, experienced this? I was 17. <laughs> And what was that, uh, that experience like? Uh, it was... Uh, it was kind of scary. It was magical. I had been fantasizing about it for so long, but I didn't know exactly what would happen. I didn't know that the blood would just come out of the mouth, and it was better than I could have ever imagined. Uh, since then, how many bodies would you say that you've been with? Um, 40. <laughs> since then, uh, how many dead bodies have you been with? Never ask a girl her number. And where do you typically find these bodies? Uh, I, uh, I work at a morgue, so that's kind of where I found them. Who would your fantasy corpse be? Mm. I would love a dead president to just be able to have power over such a powerful man. Or Emily Dickinson. Well, how do you handle the, the smell of, of, a, of a dead corpse? Do you find that to be like a positive or a negative thing? It doesn't bother me. I, I kind of like smell. I love the smell. I love the mix of blood and fresh embalming fluid. I mean, there's the dead smell and there's a dead smell. All right. And uh, what, what sort of um, standards do you have for a corpse? What do you look for in a corpse? What does any dead body do? I like a fresh dead body. Do you two find it hard to be uh, intimate with one another? No. I mean, sometimes we have to do a little extra to help one another get off. Um, what are some of those ways that you help each other? We, she likes blood. I sometimes will go and steal some blood from 
blood bank at the hospital and bring it home and <laughs> splash it all over him. And sometimes we'll also do some role play and that really hmm. is wonder it's wonderful for both of us to have someone so open-minded who understands. Do skeletons uh, turn you on or do, do the bodies have to have flesh on them? Well, <laughs> beggars can't be choosers. It's not that easy to come by a dead body. But a skeleton is my second choice. Um, have either of you thought about what it would be like for the other one to be completely dead? I don't know if I if I've shared this with him but sometimes I'll, I'll close my eyes and imagine that he's dead and it does help. What about you James? Sometimes I've, I've thought about it but um, I haven't <laughs> sometimes. told her. <laughs> I'm sure it's all the time. <laughs> right babe? <laughs> And just to be clear, you would never kill anyone just to be with them? No, I'm not a murderer. Every other man I've ever been with has tried to change me, that they thought that if I was intimate with them, that I would stop my fetish. And he isn't trying to change me. He's trying well, to we support do want to me. Well, support. So it sounds like, James, that you want to try to get over this uh, addiction more so than, than Rachel does. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say I, I do, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I do too. Um, what about your relationship with Rachel? Has that helped you wean yourself off of corpses? Not really, because she's very obsessed. I'm working on it. You can't change someone overnight. And it sounds like there's some tension. Is this something that you too often uh, argue about? There's been a lot more tension since we're trying to be together um, in the last six months. I, it's it's tough, but you know it's not any more tough than anyone else who's trying to curb their addiction as well. I think that this is perfectly normal, and we're working through it, and. I think in some time from now, we'll, we're just in rough waters. Uh, would you say that you're trying to stop being a necro, or do you think this is something that will be with you for the rest of your life? No. I think it's something that... I would love to stop, but it's my fantasy, it's who I am. If I could be bio and into living organisms, that would be, you know, amazing, but it's not who I am. And James has been great and trying to support me and we've been working together, um, but I just can't help but fantasizing and closing my eyes even when I'm with him, pretending that he's dead. What do you think uh, holds other people back from trying uh, necrophilia? I think there is stigma behind it. You know, there's a lot of shame and it's depicted in media as something horrific. A lot of horror films are revolve around the idea of, of people sleeping with dead bodies and I think that's Part of it. It's definitely the media's fault and I think that there's a lot of people who if they really admitted who they are would be necros. Um, when, when did you know that you were a, a uh, necrophiliac? Uh, that's kind of a hard question to answer because I, I really don't I don't associate myself with this really. It's just something I, I tried one time. I uh, was DJing and found a, a dead model in the bathroom. I have a friend that works at the morgue. He told me she was down there like after the 
corner, picked her up. I went to see her. He had her just laying there naked on the table, and I, I had a little fun. And, and it, it hasn't happened that much after that, but I, I do it every once in a while when I can find a hot chick to. I've uh, sort of uh, witnessed firsthand my uh, grandfather passing away in um, the guest bedroom where I used to live. And f funny enough, I was actually the first one to witness him pass away. And I don't know, man, some, for some reason it did something to me and it, you know, it, it, a signal went off and I just wanted to kiss him on the forehead or just in the lips and see what that felt like. And so I did and I, I haven't been the same since. Since most people die in old age as elderly people, you would consider your particular interest in old men to be a, a benefit to being a necrophiliac. Oh, definitely, man. Definitely it's a benefit. I, I, I honestly feel like if, uh, if they're in a nursing home or if they're in, in a certain place that's not where uh, their children are or where their grandchildren are, then dude, technically, man, they're just in a place waiting to die, man. And it's like if they die, if they die there, and, you know, I, if I'm working there at a nursing home, and it's like I see them there, you know, I, I, I've, like, fed them, I've bathed them, I've done everything in my power to sort of make their last moments memorable, they can do the same for me, you know, ask and you shall receive. I, I, they, I gave them something, they need to give me something in return. And they, I just need their, I need their body, man, you know? Who would you prefer, a dead uh, Angelina Jolie or a dead Jennifer Lopez? Oh, J-Lo all the way. I'm an ass man. If I could just have her from the waist down, that would be good. How would you describe that experience, like, emotionally when you were kissing your, your dead grandfather? <sighs> wow. Oh, this is a trip down memory lane. Um, well, you know, kissing my grandfather, I gotta tell you, uh, it, it was... I honestly felt like I, even though I technically we weren't, I, I wasn't, you know, doing anything sexually to him, just kissing his forehead. I, I felt so aroused by that, and I, I honestly I wanted to do more. I mean, I even had um, I, I I started loosening his collar, assuming to give him a hickey on the neck, but uh, my mother busted in and uh, said, "Sammy, what are you doing?" And she was uh, she was flabbergasted she was so upset and I had to see a therapist for the next 10 years because of that um, I'm still seeing the same person um, and yeah I just I really uh, I sort of just really really uh, was attracted to him in that moment I, I couldn't explain why but something and you typically only find bodies at the morgue or do you ever go grave digging do I go grave digging no man I don't go to cemeteries I mean but sometimes they don't make it to the morgue yet. Like I'm a DJ, I get girls at parties all the time that OD on Molly or something and maybe I don't have time or I don't want to wait for them to get put on ice first so I just start in immediately. Does the gender of the corpse that you're attracted to matter or the age, the gender is not an issue for you? Well, this is pretty, pretty personal. Does the gender matter? Uh, you know, to me it's, like the first person I was attracted to was a male, so I, I sort of, I guess I would prefer a man. But again, to me, it's not what they look like in the face. It's what's in the body, if the body and the structure is well put together. That's, that's all it really is. Uh, what are some major misconceptions you think the general public has about uh, necrophilia? Um, some misconceptions that the public has about necrophilia? Probably that we're all, um, well, they're all weirdos that can't get anybody else other than a dead body, so that's why they do it. But you wouldn't consider yourself one of those weirdos? Would I consider myself a weirdo? No, I don't, I, I don't think so. Um, do you think the general public has misconceptions about necrophilia? Well, being that I'm sort of new to this sort of society, I, I would say they do. Because since I've always um, sort of felt like an introvert, I can say, you know, without a doubt that we are sort of secluded or alienated from society to a point where even if we were trying to get other people in, uh, it would be sort of daunting and hard to because 
it, it's such a it's such an unholy or such a strange practice but man Christians like they can shut up man they've been freaking doing weird shit their entire life they've they burn crops they, they they used to tie people to to like you know to they used to nail people to wood they used to like tie people to chairs burn them alive i mean honest to god if that's not a weird practice then how can necro necrophiliac be that bad of a practice could you explain some of the benefits that you feel are part of being a necrophiliac oh yeah i mean yeah i could i could take all day on this uh, if uh, but i'll give you the like the Twitter Reader's Digest version, I guess, right? The, the idea that, you know, again, a lot of this courting stuff is like, I think is a social construct. Like, who says you have to uh, buy flowers and candy and, and, uh, and, you know, and the diamond ring, you know, that's a, that is like the worst social construct because it's like, you know, it was invented by an industry to, 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 to sell diamonds, right? But it was also the concept of like, of a game theory, right? If you're familiar with like the prisoner's dilemma and like things like, you know, how to, you know what decision that would you make to make sure that, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, to you, you, uh, you come out ahead in a, in a situation where you don't know what the other party's gonna do, right? So in the game, how game theory applies to, uh, to, to engagement and marriage is that, you know, you give a girl an expensive diamond ring, right? You know, and, you know, apply this also to, like, to, to uh, you know, same-sex relationships now, I guess, right? But you give a girl, a and it's very expensive, and it's supposed to be X months worth of your salary, right? Because then if you break up with her, or if you're, you know, like, if you kind of fool around like, during the engagement, or you decide you want to break up with her even because you've changed your mind, she gets to keep the ring, right? All right, so all of that is out the window with ne necrophiliac, right? With the being a necrophiliac. It's like there's no courting. There's, no, there's none of these expensive dinners and, and, and all, these, all, all these other protocols, right? It, especially you would think in this day and age where women uh, are, you know, are working for themselves. And okay, there's still maybe some, jet, like some uh, uh, salary gaps in the workforce, right? Uh, and uh, you know, and but some of it has to do with you know women, whatever, going home and having kids, and and but but the bottom line is that they could pay for themselves while they're, while they're single, right? Why, why? Like even when you're inviting me to go out, I gotta pay. You know what I mean? So that that is sort of out the window. There's and then not to mention the fact that you know they say things like you know well when you're when you're trying to make yourself vulnerable, you have to be. You know, when you have to, when you want to have a relationship, you have to make yourself vulnerable, and you have to go through an awkwardness of, of admitting that uh, you're attracted to that person. Says who, right? So you, with with the with the prac being a necrophiliac, I avoid the awkwardness, right? I avoid the the expense, right? I avoid the vulnerability. I avoid the rejection, right? I I avoid all of the complications. I avoid the drama. I avoid like. All of this like miscommunication because like, you know, she could be drawing like a runaway inference about something I said, even though I tend to be the kind of person that is, uh, tries to make himself uh, perfectly clear and, and uh, even over explains, you know? So, um, so this is all jettisoned, it's all out the window. So I'm particularly pleased by this. And I'll tell you something else. There's all this talk about like, oh, we want, you know, the trend towards authenticity and, and so on, right? Well, who's more authentic, right? Me, right, who, first of all, you're not letting me be authentic because I have to be like in hiding with my habit and I have to have this self-help group because other, because everybody's like uh, banishing us in, uh, to some extent, right? Except the ones, like I said, relatives or friends who are, who are having like this don't ask, don't tell uh, attitude, right? But I mean, but what's the alternative? These these guys who are like, you know, who they 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 don't want these complicated relationships, so they go online and they and they you know they order these 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 mannequins like that 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 have that happen to have more like like human skin and human qualities, and they're on a two-year waiting list as they customized like this thing that they want, right? But the, at the end of the day, it's fake. You know, yeah, maybe you're authentic about wanting to be with a fake, you know, with a, a fake version of a human being, right? But, 
you know, but that's a, that's a complete cop out. I mean, we're like, this is the real thing, you know, and, uh, and you're, you're honoring, you know, in some ways you're honoring someone, you know, you're, you know, so that's, that's how I feel about it. I am the president of Necrophiliacs Anonymous, and I am a necrophiliac. Hi, Norman. Hi, Norman. Um, I'm Raphael. I'm a, I'm a DJ and a tattoo artist, and I, I guess I'm a necrophiliac. Hi, Raphael. Hi, Raphael. Hi, Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a nurse, and I'm a necrophiliac. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Um, I'm James, and I'm a necrophiliac. Um, I'm a morgue assistant. Hi, James. Hi, James. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel. I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I, I always sort of feel like a little bit of an introvert. I, I feel a little bit uh, apart from society. And I'm a little uh, new to this whole thing, and you know, my all my idea of coming here is just to see how you guys are and and uh, see if this is for me, really, to find a social circle. Really. Thank Supportive. you, Sam. Thank you for coming. You know, I've tried to create this atmosphere for everyone who uh, is a necrophiliac, so um, we can speak among ourselves. It's sort of a sanctuary. Um, and where everything remain, remains in confidence because um, we're not I, we're not obviously generally accepted in society we're not really mainstream I guess we would agree right so what you know what led you to to come here well I guess when it all started for me it was, I think it was about when I was uh, six years old in uh, Newark um, I, my grandfather was living with me and my family at the time, and he was, uh, he had passed away from leukemia one, one day. When I woke up in the morning, I went to his bedroom, I saw him there, and, you know, I don't know what happened, but something, something sort of happened in me where I was literally fantasizing about sleeping with him. I don't know what it was, I don't know what sort of made me th think those thoughts, but in that moment, nobody was around. I was the first one to sort of witness that, that he passed away when I was trying to, you know, shake his shoulder, trying to wake him up. And I, all I did was just kiss his mouth and I wanted to do more, but my mother came in and stopped me. Hmm. And I guess that's when it all started for me. Hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Well, I don't know, like I said, I don't feel like I really belong here. You're a DJ, right? Uh, you're. I'm sure that uh, your uh, that profession, a lot of women uh, gravitate towards you, right? But so you you see a lot of women who are alive and well with a heartbeat who probably want you. So, like, why even divert? I'm not even asking this in a judgmental way. It's more just why divert uh, towards the dead? One, you can't get them pregnant. Um, Two, there's no arguments, no, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. Uh, three, you can't get them pregnant. That means you don't have to worry about anything. Right. You can't really get an STD if you use the right body. I mean, I don't get them too fresh. They have to be frozen first. Like, I like certain things. Sometimes I just get them like from the waist down. I don't even need the top part of the body, really. But again, like all these, all these hot chicks who are alive and well, it's like... I mean, yeah, they're, they're cool sometimes. Yeah. Every once in a while, but sometimes I like to switch it up. Yeah. I don't think I have a problem with it. It's just, it's just something I like to do for fun. Everybody else is conflicted and worried about their morals and what people will think. I'm just having fun. It's not a big deal. I, 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 I never really had a time that it just started. It just... It just began being something I did um, when I was younger, playing with dead, body, I mean, dead animals and then dead bodies eventually. But I mean, it's, it's definitely something you don't uh, you don't want to get into. 
It's not. Um, so, so you don't recommend it? No. It's disgusting. Um, what would you have to have you to say about? Never played with a dead body. Uh, well, I, I I got very close to it at one point when I was very little, at the age of six, mm -hmm. but never. Uh, it's one of the most amazing experiences that you will ever have. Really. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe we can have a big orgy. <laughs> no. get a couple bodies. I just, I mean, it's for his first time. He's got to at least experience it. <laughs> this is our problem. Mm. But I'm admitting it, and I can admit that I'm feeling really triggered right now. I just, I'm thinking about you having your first time and it just is bringing me back to my first time mm -hmm. and um uh, but I you're trying to involve him in with you and that's that's helping your addiction we're, we're here to get over it babe you need to allow me to have my thoughts you know, I'm, I'm just imagining, I'm not acting on my imagination right now, but, you know, if you did sneak into the morgue after hours, I mean, you would have more fun than you ever knew possible with a human. <laughs> uh, I find James absolutely repulsive, but he works in a morgue, so... I keep the relationship up so that when I know that he's home, I know I can sneak into the morgue. <laughs> I think Rachel is particularly enthusiastic, as you can see. And how do you guys feel about the, the morality of it all? Do you, do you find it easy to sleep at night? Do you sort of uh, think it's, do you sort of, okay, you know? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Well, James, let me ask you, when you first started to do this, well, how did you feel about the morality of it and the ethics of it? I mean, why did, why did you, initially feel uh, completely okay with it? I've never felt okay with it. Okay. Norman, he's, he's encouraging the whole thing. It's, 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 it's just, it's not, it's not productive. It's, you know, he's, he's, he's trying to, trying to, to encourage us to keep doing what we're doing and it's, it's just not, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. It, we have a different perspective on this and I feel as though if you're going to just bury a body that's really more dishonoring it because it still has a second chance at life in a way I mean when we engage with the body that we're really giving it another chance to be useful versus just making it disappear pretending that that never happened that it just is going to disintegrate into the dirt, you know, this is giving it an, another opportunity for human experience. Rachel is really interesting. She has some crazy views, but we probably could party together, maybe. Well, what about the families? And that's a personal problem with the families if they have anything wrong with what I do, the body. <laughs> She's insane. I, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting because I sort of agree with part of what you said. You know, this idea of honoring the dead. So, for instance, you know, you know those those situations where there's these disaster situations where there was a plane crash and the only way for the people to survive was to actually cannibalize on the other human beings, and then that became the, those people made exceptions for that form of cannibalism as a way of survival and so that utility, that usefulness, that applied in that situation. So like you're the idea that a body might still be an asset, you know, and uh, and would want to be useful after it passes, I that really resonates with me. I like that. She's really into it, like more than the rest of us. So um, what do we talk about you know, there's, there's you, you feel conflicted and ambivalent and you've all expressed your point of view. What is your, when is, when and who was uh, your most recent experience? You know, can you share that? I just got back from uh, DJing a party in Mykonos. 
Um, there's like some new Molly out or something. There's at least like 10 dead chicks there. I, I tried my first Necro Orgy. It was pretty cool. I think Raphael is as bad as I am. I don't think that there just happens to be bad Molly when he's around. Hmm. So I usually like to have the bodies from the morgue, like not that fresh, but man, this was good. Mykonos, yeah. that's a partying island, isn't it? Yeah. Ah. So nobody even really cared that they were gone for days. I didn't, just got rid of them on the beach. Hmm, interesting, interesting. How about you? <laughs> Sorry. I guess you like that, huh? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a dream, that's, <laughs> uh, it's, well, um, for us, it's been six months now, and um, it's been really tough. I know that I said it's been six months, but it's been about six days. You've been abstaining together, so how do you feel about that? It sounds like she's making commitment though. That's, it's, it's a good thing, but I mean, she still brings blood home. And I recently brought a body part home. Two days ago. I just really don't know if I can do this. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I've been feeling really stressed out and I think I just need to go on vacation to Syria or something. I don't know if I can abstain much longer. I'm, I'm feeling weak. I'm uh, just, there's a satisfaction that I just don't think I can ever get from him. Hmm. James, he, he, I kind of feel sorry for the kid. He, he's, I don't think he should be here. She, she makes me play dead. I thought that worked. It's was working and it just I'm getting desensitized to it I need more I don't know what's wrong with her she she needs she needs help well I mean can I just say something I, and I guess I'm trying to be a facilitator here but but it sounds like you know how things happen in baby steps and weaning away happens in baby steps so I mean, would you look at the the blood and the, the body part as sort of like an incremental decrease, right? I mean, that's that sounds like a step in the direction that you want to go, wouldn't you think? Yeah, but, um, I just I, I'd, I'd rather just stop completely. Wouldn't you? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't see myself living the rest of my life never having this experience ever again. I mean, I mean, the rest of my life seems like a, a really long time, and I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm not gonna be able to have a dead. I, I just fantasize about the dead. So we were supposed to come here for us and to be together and work on this together and it's just, it's not, it, it didn't turn out the way I anticipated. So what if they play dead, they don't speak, it's outside your home and, and this, it's this orgy. You guys play dead from beginning to end, okay? Is that acceptable to you? If it's gonna happen, then it, I don't want to know about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I just don't tell. Okay. Sometimes you just have to keep secrets. Yeah. Sometimes we do. Okay. I just don't know if I really can get satisfaction from, even if they're pretending. I mean, there is something about the smell of the embalming fluid and the stale blood and the way that a blood comes out of the mouth that is really what turns me on and you know this has been 
A motif since the 1600s depicted in art is the maiden with the skeleton. And I know that the hypothetical of this possibility, it's great and I appreciate you helping, but I really just want a dead body. Well, let me say this. I think that some of this stuff is going to have to get sorted out in our next session because we can, I, you know, I think that that couple might eventually have to break up because they're, you know, like I once heard this one expression that the only thing that's more beautiful that two people looking into each other's eyes is two people walking in the same direction and, uh, and uh, they are not moving in the same direction. You know, they're, they're, you know, maybe, maybe this thing of looking into each other's eyes only applies towards, you know, in a situation where somebody's alive and the other person's dead and we're enjoying ourselves with the dead. But if we're talking about two people who are alive having a relationship, they've got to move in the same direction. So I would suggest that, um, that uh, Rachel and uh, James kind of break it off and if, Rachel, uh, you know, starts messing around with, uh, you know, kind of goes to the same kinds of parties that Raphael, because uh, he could provide plenty of fodder, you know what I mean? Like, he, he seems to encounter a lot of dead people without having to, you know, go to a, a funeral home or a morgue. And, and, you know, if she gets involved with, uh, with Samuel, I just think that she should just, like, kind of take it real slow. Like, she could, you know, pretend he's dead and then she could like kind of be his like you know, like hey, let me use the uh, let me use this analogy like like Samuel could be like Dante and Rachel could be like Virgil and she's like taking him among the dead right and and she's helping him explore you know she's being sort of a facilitator the only the only reason that analogy is imperfect is that you know like is that Virgil wanted to take Dante through hell and back but I think I think Rachel basically wants to stay in hell.